I am honored to introduce Dr. Merrill Elper, an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Northeastern University, where she is a faculty scholar with the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice Research. Dr. Elper has quickly established herself as a distinguished scholar in the fields of communication studies, sociology, and disability studies by publishing 27 journal articles and three books since earning her doctorate from the University of Southern California in 2015. Dr. Elper earned a Prose Award Honorable Mention from the Association of American Publishers and the Outstanding Publication in the Sociology of Disability Award from the American Sociological Association for her 2017 book, Giving Voice, Mobile Communication, Disability, and Inequality. Dr. Elper's work focuses on intersectionality as it affects technology use among young people with disabilities, disability and digital media, children and families technology use, and mobile communication. She is an expert on research methods such as critical media access studies and inclusive sensory ethnography, and regularly consults with medical and industry professionals about creating inclusive media for neurodiverse children. Dr. Elper is currently working on another book titled Kids Across the Spectrums, Growing Up Autistic in the Digital Age, where she analyzes media and technology use among young people on the autism spectrum and what it means to be social in a world that is increasingly mediated. She translates her work to public forums like the New York Times and EdTech Magazine and has served as a researcher, strategist, and consultant with industry groups like Sesame Workshop, PBS Kids, Nickelodeon, Disney, and Microsoft Research. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Merrill Elper. Thank you, Sarah, for that very warm welcome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Faculty, staff, community members, thank you for the opportunity to be in conversation with you today. Thank you also to the Nobel Conference organizers, especially Lisa Helke, um, for the tremendous energy that you've brought to this endeavor. My name is Dr. Merrill Alper, and I'm delighted to further contribute to our thoughtful and thought-provoking dis discussions by talking with you about supporting mental health among autistic youth in the digital age. I'd also like to include a note at the start that this talk includes discussion of gun violence, abuse, and attempted suicide. With more possibilities than ever, for media and technology use anytime and anywhere, young people's online and offline worlds are shaping one another in complex ways. That's both for the better, like family members being able to readily stay in touch from a distance, and for worse, as with teenagers' easy access to hateful rhetoric and extreme imagery on the internet. In my academic research and professional work in the children's media, in media industry, I focused on understanding how one group of young people, those with disabilities, can derive the most benefits from media and technology, though I should state early on that I myself do not currently identify as disabled. One population who acutely experiences this duality of risks and opportunities are children, adolescents, and teenagers on the autism spectrum. Note that I am using the terms autistic and on the spectrum because survey research indicates that this language is largely preferred by autism community members, while the medical community primarily uses language like person with autism spectrum disorder or ASD. For those of you unfamiliar with autism or who are not autistic yourselves, autism is, in the broadest possible terms, a cognitive, biological, and behavioral phenomenon that influences how people move, think, and perceive the world around them. Some people on the spectrum are very talkative, while others may be unable to reliably communicate through oral speech. Some are intellectually gifted, while others have significant cognitive challenges. Some autistic individuals are highly sociable, while others prefer greater solitude. People are born autistic and remain so throughout their lives, but there is far more research on children than adults. 
Among young people, the Centers for Disease Control estimates that one in 44 eight-year-olds in the U.S. had an autism diagnosis in 2018, up from an estimated one in 166 in 2005, an uptick that researchers largely attribute to increased pediatric screenings over the past 20 years. Through new media, today's autistic youth can discover unique opportunities for socializing, communicating, regulating their often dysregulated senses and expressing themselves. For example, Autistic Adolescent Boys report that video gaming with others helps them to feel part of a group. Teens on the spectrum, though, also encounter specific threats that are born of the internet and ubiquitous mobile devices. For instance, they often experience bullying due to their peers' lack of acceptance of their differences. These personal violations are complicated by the fact that privacy and safety features on social media can be difficult for them to understand and modify. These challenges may be additionally compounded by heightened risks of co-occurring mental health conditions among autistic people, including social anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, and eating disorders. Problematic symptoms can increase over the course of adolescence and have only been intensified for many young people by the disruption to routine and stress wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic. My talk today focuses on the prospects of digital and mass media for both positively and negatively impacting the mental well-being of autistic youth, with a particular emphasis on their identity, emotional, and social development. I'll draw on research from my aforementioned forthcoming book titled Kids Across the Spectrums, Growing Up Autistic in the Digital Age, which comes out next fall with MIT Press. The book is the first ever in-depth ethnographic study of what autistic children and adolescents are doing with media and technology in their daily lives. The main point of my talk today is this. Supporting mental health among young people on the autism spectrum in the digital age requires looking beyond just the medical model of disability, which contends that the challenges of impairment primarily concern the mind and body of the individual disabled person, and instead towards a greater understanding of how additional structural forces and social factors shaped by class, gender, sexuality, racial and ethnic background, and more, intersect with the different forms of emotional security and insecurity that diverse autistic youth feel. I'm gonna share stories of three young people from my field work who together illustrate how autistic youth mental health is incredibly multifaceted. And I'll conclude by offering some takeaways and reflections that I hope offer some general learnings as well. But first, I'd like to provide some more background on different philosophical approaches to disability, as well as to address and debunk several harmful myths and stereotypes concerning autistic youth, media technologies, and mental health. Scholars in the academic field of disability studies talk about how discourses around disability are shaped by different philosophical frameworks or models. One of these models, as I mentioned earlier, is the medical model, which locates disability within the disabled individual's mind and body. An alternative is the social model, which contends that the world is more disabling than a given person's actual impairments. When it comes to autism and reconciling these models, neurodiversity is a philosophy that in part reflects both. That is, autism is more of a difference than inherently a deficit, and yet it is important to acknowledge and treat the very real physical and mental health issues that autistic people face on a daily basis. Looking through the lens of neurodiversity also allows us to see various myths and stereotypes about autism, technology, and mental health in a more nuanced way. The first of these is the myth that screen media causes autism in young children. These claims are not backed up with causal evidence, especially since autism is a condition that, again, people are born with. But they do tap into cultural anxieties about new media, like smartphones, quote unquote, we rewiring our brains, and make parents, especially mothers, feel guilty about giving their children screen time. 
Another harmful stereotype is that autistic people are robotic and emotionless. This stereotype is partly rooted in the work of influential, though later disgraced, child psychologist Bruno Bettelheim and his 1959 publication of the article Joey, a Mechanical Boy, in the magazine Scientific American, in which he compares his autistic patient Joey, whose self-portrait appears here, to a, quote, machine, because he did not dare be human, unquote. This dehumanization and characterization of autistic, the autistic child as a machine leads to robots and other technologies being positioned as the ultimate therapeutic solution for teaching neurotypical or non-autistic emotionality to children on the spectrum. Meanwhile, highly effective but non-technological therapeutic aids like service dogs do not receive widespread insurance or research funding. Gun control efforts in the US are consistently derailed by those who ignore calls to ban assault weapons and instead promote spurious linkages between loners who commit mass atrocities, undiagnosed autism, and violent video game play, or the myth of the autistic shooter, as noted in this New York Times headline. The reality is that autistic people are actually far more likely to be the recipient of intentional physical aggression than the aggressors. These various one-dimensional tropes do little to materially address the mental health needs of young people on the autism spectrum. Moreover, they also serve to reify a very narrow conception of the prototypical autistic child as a white boy, such as the one pictured here in the poster for the Netflix show Atypical. This is problematic on several levels. For one, Autistic girls and children of color have historically been undercounted when it comes to autism diagnoses. Second, low-income black and Latino autistic children encounter significant health disparities that impact their overall well-being. And thirdly, a great deal of published autism research fails to even report the race or ethnicity of research participants, rendering non-white autistic kids doubly invisible. For my book, I wanted to understand how these myths collectively got autism, youth, and technology so wrong, and what was gained by taking a more inclusive look. I interviewed and observed over 60 autistic young people and their families, uh, children who were ages 3 to 13 living in Boston and Los Angeles from 2013 through the start of the pandemic in 2020. They were speaking and non-speaking, some were autistic siblings, as in the left-hand photo, and many were the children of immigrants. I focused on their media consumption, creation, and circulation, such as the girl using Spotify in the right-hand photo. I also talked with their caregivers about how technology fit into their family's overall habits, values, beliefs, and routines, as ethnographers have done with families of non-disabled children for years. I'd like to offer you three snapshots of what the mental health needs of autistic youth can look like beyond a purely medical lens, the role of technology in their well-being, and how these needs and media usage intersect with different social and structural issues. I'll note that all names are pseudonyms for privacy's sake, and all faces and personally identifying information have been blurred or covered up in photos, as on the right. First. Talking with six-year-old Casey, pictured here, and her single mom, Jennifer, who were white and low income, reinforced the role that identity and having one's whole self validated by others and through media plays in autistic youth mental health. Identity development can be particularly challenging for autistic young people for several reasons. Adolescents on the spectrum report being unsure, for example, if autism is a disability. Parents may disclose a diagnosis early on to their child, and others hold off on telling them until later. Some autistic children's comprehension of autism may be basic, while others are very self-aware. Social identity theory, proposed by psych psychologist Henri Tafel, posits that humans have a propensity to define themselves based on group membership, and that the positive feelings that one derives from such affiliation results in a greater sense of well-being and self-esteem. 
Research shows that the more positive attributes an autistic adult associates with autism, such as having unique problem-solving skills, the more likely they are to identify with other autistic people. And having positive collective identity can buffer some, though not all, of the negative psychological impacts of ableism or the systemic discrimination of disabled people. Though developing a positive sense of identity is important for the mental health of youth on the spectrum, autism is only one component of autistic young people's identity. In addition to being on the spectrum, Casey here is transgender. Jennifer thought that being male presenting at the time of Casey's diagnosis made it easier for her to access needed services, given the aforementioned gender biases in diagnosis rates. Jennifer herself identified outside normative characterizations of gender, sexuality, and disability. Um, specifically, she said as, quote, genderqueer around to femme and autistic but undiagnosed. The underlying reasons why are unclear, but a growing body of research su suggests that autistic people may be more likely than the general population to identify as LGBTQ. I sat with Casey and Jennifer as they rewatched one of their favorite pieces of media, Free to Be You and Me, the 1974 televised special starring, starring actress Marlo Thomas and promoting gender equality. Perhaps some of you remember it fondly. <laughs> It had been not so legally downloaded by Jennifer onto an iPad, seen here. Both mother and daughter had a strong affinity for free to be. Jennifer shared, quote, I had that on ever since Casey was little, and I never turned it off because I loved it so much. Considering the educational element, I asked Casey if she had learned anything from watching it. She replied, quote, that we're all free to be ourselves, you and me, free to be, echoing the title song's lyrics. Media can play a role in developing positive collective identity, but youth on the spectrum have limited opportunities to see autistic people accurately represented in mainstream media, especially characters that aren't white cisgender boys. Despite these constraints, kids like Casey find ways to learn more about themselves through a media universe that includes online platforms, books and movies, as well as media characters that are not explicitly autistic and media themes about inclusion more broadly. This exploration is significantly shaped by having friends, teachers, and parents like Jennifer who facilitate and enable such play and curiosity. Next, despite the best efforts of caregivers like Jennifer, sometimes the structural inequalities at play in shaping autistic children's mental health are nearly impossible to overcome. The struggles of eight-year-old Amaya, who is Afro-Latina, pictured here, and how those struggles manifested in her media use underscore the many failures of educational and health institutions to support autistic young people's emotional thriving. Kimberly, also a single mom, described her daughter, daughter Amaya as, quote, an extremely sensitive child, one who fiercely protected other kids in class that she saw crying or thought might be hurt. Amaya's emotional intensity was bound up with her dual diagnoses of autism and OCD. She sometimes experienced intense anxiety, which was compounded by the environmental stress of living in a Boston neighborhood with a high incidence of gun violence. Her anxiety had been heightened the year prior by a teacher who assaulted her, leading Kimberly to transfer Amaya to another school. On top of all this, Kimberly had been fighting for the past three months with the state insurance provide, health insurance provider to cover additional OCD therapy for her daughter. Said Kimberly, quote, I will not accept it. She needs professionals that can help her. Since the incident at school, Kimberly had seen Amaya's ongoing mental health issues manifest in a drastic change in her daily habits, including her media use. Amaya had lost interest in recreational activities like playing in the park and going swimming. Kimberly explained that, quote, she doesn't want to play with toys, doesn't want to read books. Instead, Amaya was self-isolating and soothing herself within the security of her living room and through the predictability of screen media. She had also lately been repeatedly watching YouTube videos of people hurting each other. The success of these coping mechanisms was unclear. Kimberly tried to shape whatever lessons her daughter was possibly learning from the YouTube videos by talking to Amaya about the content. She said, quote, I have to sit there and explain to her 
There's a lot of bad people in this world and a lot of good people. Amaya's deep sensitivity provides a radical counterpoint to the cultural stereotype that people on the autism spectrum lack empathy, act robotically, and are unable to understand and display emotion. Her story also highlights how mental health is influenced in both direct and indirect ways by technology. For Amaya, this included how easy it was for her to replay violent YouTube videos on her iPad and a recommendation algorithm that served her such content and monetized her views. Sociological factors also matter, like her health insurer's denial of therapy coverage and the systemic violence that black girls and autistic people of color are all too often subjected to in the US. In addition to identity development and emotional development, the final story of Sailor, a 13-year-old white girl living in an upper-middle-class Boston suburb, illustrates how smartphones and social media apps add complicated new layers um, to autistic youth's friendships and social well-being. By their own account, what teens on the spectrum are doing interpersonally with media is not completely unlike neurotypical kids. When I asked Sailor if she thought being autistic made her experience with social media different from her peers, she replied, quote, I don't think the spectrum is affecting anything, to be honest. I don't know, all my friends are basically doing the same thing, and I'm just doing the same thing, end quote. Empirically, what Sailor shared bears somewhat true. How adolescents on the spectrum engage with technology for social purposes parallels and diverges from media use and peer engagement among non-autistic kids in multiple ways. Autistic boys report, for example, that video gaming is the media activity that they too engage in most frequently with friends, and that this play largely strengthens their friendships. Like non-autistic girls, girls on the autism spectrum similarly acknowledge that while online friends are easier to make, such friendships have risks and limitations, and in-person socializing can lead to more authentic connections. However, there are significant differences. For example, autistic adolescents reportedly use social media more for entertainment than friendship building. They are also at increased risk for cyberbullying and bullying compared to neurotypical youth. This victimization and its emotional burdens further compound their difficulties with mental health and in establishing friendships. Girls on the spectrum additionally report anxiety over social disapproval, which spills over into their online, offline lives and online lives. In, in Sailor's case, her mother Maggie relayed to me that back in sixth grade, Sailor had difficulty distinguishing between, quote, somebody who would accept her or somebody who would pretend to be her friend but was not really looking out for her, end quote. Sailor talked about how her relationship with one group of girls was confusing in terms of how they treated her in person and on social media. Said Sailor, quote, on my old Instagram, these girls who bullied me, they called me fat and stuff. But the day before, they said that we were like friends because they said I could try on some of their clothes at their house because they said my clothes were awful and because we're about the same size. These girls later told, told Sailor that she should post on Snapchat about wanting to take her own life, which Sailor then posted out of peer pressure. Another mother saw the message on her child's Snapchat and contacted Maggie, who, quote, went into crisis mode. The incident led to Sailor attending counseling steadily to talk about her issues and her relationships with her peers. By age 13, Sailor could reflect on her experiences with bullying and talk about them as part of her past. Like other young teens, she was aware of the overt dangers of having an online presence and had used social media to curate her self-presentation. The year I got bullied, she said, I always got picked on for having really bad Instagram photos. I was like nine and I didn't know. I just wanted to be cool and stuff. She subsequently changed some of her privacy settings, creating more intimate audiences through private Snapchat stories. Sailor explained that she did not post awkward photos on her non-private Snapchat story anymore, quote, because if everybody just sees a weird picture of me, then everyone's gonna screenshot it, which actually did happen when I was little, but I think they forget about that now. With the help of her family, her local community, and licensed therapists, Sailor was able to create some psychological distance from her challenges with cyberbullying, but the process was ongoing, as was the evolution of the social media platforms with which she and her peers engaged. 
These snapshots from the lives of Casey, Amaya, and Sailor start to fill out a much needed fuller picture of the mental health needs of autistic children, adolescents, and teenagers, and both the opportunities and limitations that new media technologies offer them for identity, emotional, and social development. I have three takeaways to share from their stories, more broadly from the young people that I spend time with for my book, and from some of my newer research on older autistic youth and their media engagement. First, addressing autistic youth mental health and the role of technology is far from one size fits all, or even most. You may have heard the phrase, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, um, which is a play on the stereotypic colloquialism, if you've met one blank, you've met them all. In other words, it's important not to tokenize or extrapolate from a single autistic person's experience. This applies to mental health supports and how new media can help or hinder their emotional well-being. For example, young people like Casey, who are both autistic and gender minority, as in transgender, non-binary, or gender non-conforming, they report unique social difficulties, such as communicating their needs around gender and correcting the pronouns that other people use to identify them. On a more positive note, some also describe the psychosocial benefits of connecting with other gender minority autistic youth. For instance, in a content analysis that I'm currently conducting with some research collaborators, we're finding that the internet and apps like TikTok specifically potentially offer ample opportunities for LGBTQ autistic young people to talk about and share their journey with others like them likely far more so than with in-person peers who may be hard to connect with in their local communities. Next, it's important not to forget the ways in which mental health isn't only about the mind, but the physical as well. Disability studies scholar Eli Clare reminds us that when we're talking about the body, and particularly the disabled body, a more apt term would be the body-mind, because one cannot be separated from the other. With respect to mental health, this awareness of physicality relates to the case of autistic youth who have had traumatic experiences like Amaya. The same diagnostic tools for assessing trauma and PTSD in non-autistic youth may not be appropriate for those on the spectrum, though there is very little research investigating this. One reason for potentially needing new tools is that autistic people's levels of distress may be more strongly related to their senses than for non-autistic people. Individuals on the autism spectrum often report difficulties with sensory regulation. Some can be easily overstimulated, while others seek out additional sensory input in their environments. Not much is known about how media, not just the content, but the senses it stimulates, plays into how autistic youth cope with trauma and other events that negatively impact their mental and physical health. Finally, while the internet is often thought of as affecting mental health, that is, causing positive or negative effects based on media use habits, it's important to think about the internet as an important site for information gathering about mental health, too be it from peers or clinical professionals. For example, our content analysis of hashtag autistic talk, um, or autistic TikTok, is showing how the app can be a site for autistic youth to locate mental health resources, find others with similar experiences, and engage in sometimes uncomfortable discussions about the inclusivity within the disability community. However, such information seeking can also backfire, with medical misinformation being rife on the app, Autistic youth who struggle with body dysmorphia and disordered eating might also all too easily be finding communities online who promote extremely unhealthy behavior, which often flies under the radar of social media content moderators. In closing, gaining a richer understanding of the emotional complexity of youth on the autism spectrum, as well as how media and technology impact their emotional development could result in educational, therapeutic, and social services that better address their diverse needs. The effects of media on autistic youth mental health are not straightforward. Stereotypes and myths about autism, youth mental health, and technology use are not only bad for kids on the spectrum who have been marginalized historically, but they flatten out the emotional depth of all autistic children as well. 
Thank you for listening. And if you're interested in getting updates on my forthcoming book, which again, won't come out for a whole other year, um, you can sign up for updates, updates at tiny.cc backslash kids across the spectrums. Thank you.